Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Psalm 10. So tonight we're going to be doing part two of feeling abandoned by God. And so last week, we kind of went the realm of that if we believe that we're abandoned by God, it could lead to becoming indifferent towards God. It can lead us to becoming agnostic and even atheist if we don't consider the truth and consider what the scripture says and consider what God says concerning us who are in Christ Jesus and you know, feeling abandoned. Tonight, what I want to talk about is more on the when we believe that we've been abandoned by God and it leads us to depression and it leads us to absolute discouragement and believing the lie that God doesn't care for us and believing the lie that God doesn't love us. And I've even seen people get to the point of, so, of becoming so desperate and so discouraged and depressed that they've attempted to or have actually taken their lives because they believe that there's just no hope. I mean, the Bible says God is hope, right? And they, they, they believe that no one loves them, and yet the Bible says God is love. And so they get to the point where they just don't even want to live. They see no way out. Um, whatever the case might be, they don't believe that God loves them or that God forgives them or that God cares about them or that um, God can take them through, right? And so they get depressed, discouraged, and it leads them even to committing suicide. So let's just read verse 1, Psalm 10. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble. Believing that we've been abandoned by God can lead to becoming indifferent, agnostic, or even atheist. And beginning in verse 1, the psalmist is inquiring into the Lord's inaction. Briefly, I just want to kind of go through what we talked about last week. He starts off by inquiring into the Lord's inaction. He's frustrated with God. Why are you not acting? Ever felt like that? Lord, why are you letting this happen in my life? Why are you not changing this in my life? Why don't you remove this situation or remove me from this situation? How come you don't just take the feeling away or the temptation away? Lord, why are you not acting? I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. I'm believing and I'm being patient and I'm going to church and I'm worshiping and I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing. And I still feel like, and I see this in my life, there is no action from you. There's no you talking to me. There's no word of encouragement. There's no action happening. And so from verses 2 through 11, the psalmist is upset. We see that. He's frustrated, absolutely upset as he views the actions of the wicked and as he wonders about how God can remain apathetic or inactive. And in a sense, he's kind of accusing. He's kind of questioning God's character. How can you be so apathetic? How can you remain inactive? I thought you were the God of righteousness. I thought you were the God of justice. Maybe sometimes, well, I thought you were the God of love. I thought you cared about your children. I feel like you don't care about me. And then from verses 12 through 15, the psalmist prays for the Lord to act. He's like, okay, Lord, arise. Do something about it. It's almost like he's saying, prove yourself. Come on. Show them what's up. Show them who you are. Don't let them get away with it. Don't let them mock you. Do something. Reveal yourself. Inflict fear and judgment upon them. And we talked about these verses, you know, in Revelation, Solomon, and Philippians. uh, These are basically prophecies about what's going to happen to those who do not give their lives to Jesus. These are prophecies that talk about God's wrath and God's judgment and him punishing those who continue to refuse him and in the end, refuse him. These are scary verses. And I know sometimes we're like, how come you're not acting now? But yet the Bible says he will act but it's in his timing, and oftentimes it's, well, what about my timing? It's, I, I want it now. I want this to happen right now. And, of course, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, and that's talking about God's wrath. You know, one thing that we need to fear is God's wrath, the severity of God's wrath. Give place to wrath. Let the Lord have his wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And it's a matter of believing him here. Okay, now I just have to believe that God's going to handle it, even if they get away with it forever here on this planet. 
God is going to handle it. Even if there is no justice for me, God is going to handle it. Even if I'm wronged and I'm hurt over and over and over and over again, God's going to handle it. And it's hard to believe that, right? You have to believe that. But that's what the Lord is asking us to do. He's asking us to believe his word, to trust him, that he's going to handle it. You know, in, in the New Testament times, the apostles had to believe that as they were being martyred, martyred, they were being killed for starting churches. We have the luxury of starting churches here. The worst thing that could happen is uh, we don't have enough people to pay the bills, and so the church ceases to exist. Back then, starting a church, when revival was happening, I mean, people were giving their lives to Jesus left and right. And they needed places to meet because there were so many people. But because they were starting churches, they were being killed. And the apostles, they, they had to believe that. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. In fact, it was Paul who wrote that. And he knew a little bit about being persecuted. He knew what it was like to be wronged. He, he knew what it was like to be at the short end of the stick of justice and the injustices that were done upon him, the hurts, the blame, the lies, the persecution, and eventually his execution, right? But he had to believe, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And he says, do not avenge yourselves. If anyone had a right to avenge himself, it would have been Paul with all of the things that happened to him and all of the things that people did to him. But he says, no. Maybe even people were tempted, hey, Paul, do you want us to do it for you? We'll, we'll take it. We'll do it. And Paul would say, no, 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 no. Let the Lord handle it. I'm not going to handle it. I don't want you to handle it. Let the Lord handle it. Now, sometimes God seemingly abandons us in order to test us. Again, I say seemingly abandons because in Christ Jesus, he does not abandon us because the Bible says so. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, God would never leave you nor forsake you. So it feels like we're abandoned. It feels like we are on our own, but be careful with feelings. We live by faith, not by feelings. Amen? Amen. So when you feel abandoned, sometimes it's because God is testing us. And that's where we left off last week. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Well, that's some hardcore weeping right there to where I'm just, I, I don't have tears anymore. I've ran out of tears. I'm too tired to weep, to groan. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all of the people was grieved every man for his sons and his daughter. Not only did he have to deal with the fact that his own wife and his own kids had been kidnapped, but now he had to worry about the fact that his friends were turning on him and saying, let's kill him. You ever had a friend do that to you? How about a whole church, a whole city? Let's kill him. It's, his, it's David's fault that this has happened to us. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Lord, why, why did you let this happen? I'm serving you. I'm leading your people in victory. You told me to do this. Now I come back and you let this happen? And now you're letting them basically threaten to murder me? They want to murder me. But notice that it says that David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And so then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring the ephod here to me. Now, real quick, the Urim and the Thummim were attached to the breastplate of the ephod. By means of the Urim and the Thummim, God could be consulted and his will determined. So instead of running, instead of hiding, instead of saying, all right, who's first? I'll take you guys on. Let's do this. Done this before. I've been here before. He didn't do that. He talks to the priest, and he says to the priest, bring me that where I can consult the Lord. Let me go spend time with the Lord. I'm going to go and inquire God's will. I know how I'm feeling. I see the situation. I'm on my own. I'm by myself. I'm in one of the lowest points of my life right now. I don't know how my wife and my kids are doing, and everybody wants to kill me because they're mad that their wives and their kids have been kidnapped. 
but let me consult with the Lord. Let me determine his will. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. What was the test here? The test was to see what David was going to do. That's a hardcore test. Jeez, Lord, really? Just ask me, I'll tell you, I love you. Just ask me, I'll tell you, I'm faithful. But sometimes, really, honestly, when it comes down to it, the only way to really, really, really know is when we go through something like that. When we go to, through something that really affects us and, and could cause us to either stray away from the Lord or come closer, closer to the Lord. And in this case, David chose to come closer to the Lord. Let's learn from David. Look what he did. He sought the Lord. You think he felt like seeking the Lord? I'm sure he felt like complaining against the Lord. I'm sure he felt like griping against the Lord. Lord, man, what? I'm your servant. You said a man after your own heart. What's up? Why? Why are you letting this happen? None of that happened. He just, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And the Lord told him what to do. Whatever you might be going through, Lord, what do you want me to do? First thing the Lord's going to say is, trust me. Believe in my word. Worship and fellowship with believers. Okay, I'm going to do that. Do I feel like doing that? No. But I'm going to do it because it's about being obedient. That's what faith is all about. Check out this quote. God wants our heart to be his. Even in distress, sorrow, hardship, and yes, when we feel all alone. He is always watching. He is always waiting. He is always wanting you to give your heart to him. No coercion, no gifts attached. He wants you to give your heart to him simply because he is God. And that's usually the test. That's why the Lord allows that. Well, Lord, I'll give my life to you if there's blessings attached. The Lord says, how about you just come to me because I am God? And that alone. No blessing, no answered prayers, no delivering you from this situation, no, uh, you know, uh, making wrongs right. Just, just follow me and be with me no matter what. Even if I allow you to go through this for the rest of your life here on this earth, the fact that you will be with me, my grace is sufficient for you. Give me your heart simply because I am God. And that's it. Sometimes God seemingly abandons due to rebellion. Again, I say seemingly abandons because usually it's we leave him first. Usually it's not him leaving us, it's we leave him. We depart from him. We depart from the word. We depart from obeying him. We leave him, as we see in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Or we grieve him, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Or we quench him, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. We just continue in rebellion. We refuse to repent. We refuse to make the adjustments and the changes. And the Lord's constantly saying, please, don't, don't do that. Come to me. Stay with me. Say no to that. Say yes to me. But we continue to disobey. We continue to compromise. And so we continue to rebel. And we leave the Lord. And then it's like there's that moment where we feel it. God is not with me anymore. And then we blame him for leaving us. When in reality, if we look at the situation, we've left him. And that's the reason why we feel like that. Because we walked away from him. But my people would not heed my voice. And Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. I find go. You want nothing to do with me. You want to do your own thing. So I gave them over. I stopped begging them to come back to me. I stopped begging them to stay with me. I just, just stopped. And they went. I let them go. So I guess, so he was holding them. Please don't go. Please don't go. And they're just like, ah, let go, let go, let go. Kept fighting it, fighting it, fighting it. Finally, the Lord's like, fine, go. That's what you want. You want to go. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. And that's still the Lord's heart. This was said in a moment where 
Israel had walked away from the Lord. He, they already had departed from the Lord. And here's, here's God saying, if my people were to call on my name, I would forgive them their sins. That, that's the Lord's heart right there. So even when we leave him, he's still there going, man, if you just, if you just call on me, if you just to humble yourself, pray and seek my face, I would meet you. I would be right there. I would hear from heaven and I would forgive your sin. Therefore, say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. So again, the Lord's heart is, return to me. Stop running away from me. Stop walking away from me. Return to me, and I will return to you. And this is God telling the prophet, tell my people this. Tell my people that I'm asking them to return to me. That if re they return to me, I will return to them. And then David, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Of course, Psalm 51 is the psalm of repentance. And we see David's heart repenting before the Lord. And he humbled himself and he repented. And he called upon the name of the Lord. And as he's calling upon the name of the Lord, he says, do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And when you follow the story, it was David that walked away from the Lord. The Lord never walked away from David. David walked away from the Lord. In the times when the kings were supposed to lead their armies in battle as the Lord had called them to, David decided not to do God's will. He decided to just kick back and relax. And that led to one thing, to another, to another, to another, to where we find him in Psalm 51 going, do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. It was David that walked away. And so when David humbled himself and he called upon the Lord, man, immediately the Lord came upon him. He was restored. And you'll see it in Psalm 51. He says, and then, and then I will tell everyone about your goodness. And you see the rest of the story with David is, he walked in the ways of the Lord. Sometimes God seemingly abandons us so that we don't settle. Okay? So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. And Paul is talking about how there's always going to be a, a discontentment. There's, there's always going to be this agony where we desire to be with God, but we're going to have to go through that while we're here living on earth. And just that desire to be with them, how it's agony on us because we are not with them, but we're down here on earth having to go through temptation, having to go through spiritual um, you know, warfare, and having to deal with stuff and life and our bodies and you know, people and so forth. And so he says this, but, but the verse before that, Check this out. The Spirit of God stimulates our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. He puts a little of heaven in our hearts so that we'll never settle for less. Well, that's a paraphrase of a paraphrased version, the MSG version, by the way, which is like the Message Bible version or something like that. But the idea, what, what Paul is saying is, sometimes the Lord like, aggravates us a little bit. Sometimes he, he kind of purposely does that so that we don't settle and get super comfortable. Because we got to be careful as Christians to not go on vacation mode. I'm just waiting till heaven. <laughs> and sometimes the Lord's like, no, no, that's not good for you. That's not good for you. I feel like if I told my kids, hey, you know what, kids, you're my kids. This is your house. You do whatever you want. You don't have to work. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to do chores. You can have all the benefits and all the blessings, but no responsibilities, no accountability. Just enjoy life. I want you to enjoy your life. Do whatever you want. What are my kids going to do? They're going to go crazy. Straight up. Their flesh is going to be like, yes. And they're going to mess things up, and that's on me for allowing that to happen. No, 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 kids. Every day we do chores. I aggravate them a little bit. Pick up after your, you know, clean up after yourself. I aggravate them. I aggravate them because it's good for them because I'm teaching them responsibility because I don't want them to be lazy and irresponsible. I want them to learn to 
follow through, that when they get things out like their toys, they put them away, that when they're cooking, they clean their mess. I mean, things like that. So the Lord does that with us as well. He wants us to learn patience. He wants us to learn perseverance. He wants us to be consistent. And so he'll aggravate us a little bit to cause us to not settle. So again, the Lord will sort of aggravate us so that we don't become settled, stagnant, content, or comfortable with this world because it's easy for that to happen. It's real easy to forget that we're actually going to heaven. Right? It's easy to forget about the rapture. Right? When was the last time you thought about the rapture? That today might be the day of the rapture. See, it's real easy to become comfortable and used to this world. As if this world is everything. Settled, stagnant, content, comfortable with this world because John said, and the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So the reason why the Lord aggravates us a little bit, the reason why we're not all rolling and having our own yachts and helicopters and just living the good life, the reason why the Lord allows us to struggle, the reason why the Lord allows the injustices, the reason why the Lord allows that to happen, like the trials and even the temptations, is to remind us to look forward to being with him, to desire to be in heaven and to be about heaven rather, to be, rather than being about living our lives here on this earth because this world is passing away in the lust of it. And so the Lord reminds us of that. The truth is, God doesn't abandon us who, us, who are in Christ Jesus. That's the truth. We who are in Christ Jesus, the truth is this, God does not abandon us. Just because we feel abandoned doesn't mean that he has abandoned us. We have to believe that we who are in Christ Jesus, God does not forsake nor abandon. So we talked about this word abandoned, right? It means having been deserted, cast off or cast aside, deserted, forsaken. Look at Paul. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. Where was God during those times? How come God didn't deliver him from that? Why did God allow that to happen? In deaths often? Jeez, Paul, how many times did you almost die? Lord, why would you allow Paul to almost die? What was he doing? Oh, yeah, starting churches. What was he doing? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. What was he doing? He was going to anyone and, and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ that they might give their lives to him. That's what Paul was doing. Lord, why would you allow frequently, often, stripes, prisons, deaths, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Some people would be handicapped after that. Some people would even die just from one session of 39 whipping. He got it five, five times. Imagine how jacked up his body was after that. Three times I was beaten with rods. I ever been jumped by bats? Mess someone up. Lord, why did you let that happen? He was just preaching the gospel. It wasn't like he was breaking into someone's house. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why did you? God, where were you when he was being beaten? Three times. Once I was stoned. You ever had a big rock hurled at you at high velocity as hard as possible? I have. At one time we were, we came up against one of our enemies he saw his car, grabbed a whole bunch of like rocks, big rocks, and went after his car to break windshields and just dent the car up. And I was the first one, man. I went, boom, succeeded, went right through the windshield. And as soon as I did that, I turned around, right, to run. And I didn't see my, my homie <laughs> right there doing the exact same thing I just did. And he went as hard as he could, man. He went like this, and he let it go, and it hit me right, boom, right on the chest, boom, and I felt it. But the adrenaline was going. I just kept running. But man, when I stopped running, I was like, dude, bro, that hurt. I didn't say that, but inside, in, my, in my inner voice, ow, man, that hurt. Imagine if that would hit my face. I would have broken my face. He threw it as hard as he could. Imagine if he would have hit my head. Even God was there. Even God was there. Even God was there. 
when I was committing crimes like that. But I've been hit by a stone. I mean, I'm, dude, it hurts. Could you imagine? Over and over and over again. And of course, what are people trying to do? They're trying to get the head shot. I'm going for the head. And what happened was, it happened to where he was unconscious. So they dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead, and they left him. Then he bounces back up, and he goes back into the same town. That's gangster right there, by the way. I mean, that's straight up, that's straight up hood right there. But how come he didn't get up and go, really, Lord? Man, preaching the gospel, and you let these people do this to me? Three times I was shipwrecked? What? A night and a day I have been in the deep, in other words, in the sea, floating, like the Titanic. Where was God there? God, why did you let that happen? Why would you let that happen? I'm preaching the gospel. Why am I in the ship so I can go preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Everything that I'm doing here is for you, Lord. Why do you let these things happen? In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers. Ever been robbed before? In perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the cities, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. I mean, basically, everywhere he went, anyone he, he made contact with, drama, temptation, persecution, prosecution in weariness and toil in sleeplessness often in hunger and thirst where was God during those times in fastings often you think he was like hey you know I think I'm going to fast just to kind of get myself set or no he had to fast there was nothing to eat he didn't have a choice things were so bad that he was just like I'm going to have to fast because things are that bad the spiritual warfare is so thick that I have to fast. My body is not functioning from all of the stuff that I've gone through that I'm so distracted that I'm going to have to fast just so that I can concentrate. Or perhaps, man, I'm being tempted so much. I'm so tired that I'm going to have to fast just to deny my flesh so that my flesh doesn't have power over me. But whatever the case, often this happened. Often. In cold and nakedness. And he's not griping, he's not complaining, he's just saying, he's just sharing the stuff that he's going through. Because they were saying that he wasn't real. And he's like, well, I'm pretty real. I'm willing to go through some stuff for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes with us, we're not willing to go through the trials and the temptations and we just leave God. We accuse God. We gripe against God. We have to be careful with that. We get discouraged, demoralized, insecure, feeling judged and condemned, feeling worthless, despair, depressed, even suicidal at times. I mean, after having gone through all of that, I mean, how could you not feel like that, right? I'm just preaching the gospel. I'm just doing God's work here. That's all I'm doing. I just showed up to share with people God's love. That, that's all I'm here to do, and, and this is what ends up happening to me. And so how could you not feel like this? You start saying things like, God doesn't love me, God doesn't care about me, or I must be worthless. I must be worthless. I must be a mistake. I, I don't know. I, I just don't know where God is in, in, in all of this. I'm going through it. I call upon him, and here I am once again, out in the deep, floating. God doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. I'm starving again. This was, Paul, this was Paul's life. I, I don't know how it is with us, with you, but have you ever gone through something to where you're like, yeah, you know what? I don't know if God loves me. I don't think he cares about me. I must be worthless. All I'm trying to do is encourage you to know that, one, you're not alone in feeling like that, okay? Not only that, but hopefully to encourage us that people went through some gnarly stuff in the Bible and still they kept the faith. Still, they kept the faith. If they can do it, we can do it. The same spirit that was in Paul is the same spirit within you and me right now. So let's not leave the
the same Holy Spirit. Let us not grieve the same Holy Spirit. Let us not quench the same Holy Spirit. And then with the same Holy Spirit, we'll be able to overcome like they overcame. Amen? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. Now, David is saying this, but Jesus said this while he was nailed on the cross. Nailed on the cross. God, why would you let that happen? The Bible says that if Jesus wanted to, he could have had legions of angels come and deliver him. He didn't have to do the cross. Even Jesus said, Lord, if it's possible, can you remove this cup from me? Can you remove this cup from me so I don't have to go through what I'm about to go through? And then he's like, you know what, Lord? Your will be done, not mine. And so he's going through it. He's going through God's will. Okay, here's David and then Jesus, suffering for doing God's will. And in the midst of God's will, of obedience and faith in God, this happens to where David and then Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hey, you know what? If you feel abandoned, if you feel abandoned, know that Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. Because see, with Jesus, it was more than a feeling. It was fact. All of our sins were put upon him. And so God had to, he had to turn his back and actually forsake Jesus because of all of our sins were upon him. You see, when that was happening, God was willing to forsake his only begotten son so that he wouldn't have to forsake us. And so when that happened, Jesus, Jesus knew it. He knew it. He felt it. He knew that God had to abandon him right there because the sins of the world were upon him. And then he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We may feel it. Jesus actually went through it. As a matter of fact, Jesus even went to Sheol. He went to the pit where the demons are lurking. He went down there. We haven't gone there by the grace of God. Jesus knows what it feels like to be abandoned because he actually was abandoned. Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. We're not the only ones that have gone through this. Psalmists have felt this way. They wonder about how God can remain apathetic and inactive, unmoved, uninvolved, uninterested, not working. See, we accuse God of being unmoved and uninvolved and uninterested. We accuse God of not working, when in reality, he is working. He is moved, and he is involved, and he is interested. He is active. Fear not, for I am with you, God says. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And it's just a matter of believing that. We have to believe that. That when you're going through what you're going through, first thing, fear not. Second thing, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. We have to believe God. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Interesting, it says future. Nor does it then say to give you a present. No, a future. Because present life right now and for the rest of our lives here on earth it may be trials and tribulations. But the future in Christ, heaven, face-to-face, -face, paradise. No more tears, no more hurt. Just blessing and joy, true love, face-to-face -face with our Heavenly Father. That's an awesome future. And sometimes we're willing to give up that future because of the present. Be careful with that. Let us not be like that. To give you a future and a hope, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. It doesn't say I will act on your behalf. I will listen. I will listen. What I choose to do after that, that that's my will. But I will listen to your prayers. 
The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And if not here on this earth, <laughs> guarantee it in heaven. Either way, that's true. Because as the disciples were being martyred, there was no deliverance. They were being martyred. But then, when they died, they opened their eyes again, and they were present with the Lord. <laughs> Delivers them out of them all. They're set free forever. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the same Paul that was talking about the many perils in his life. Shipwrecked three times, beaten five times, killed often. <laughs> it's crazy. He said that. I am persuaded. His conclusion was, my persuasion is that I am persuaded. He can't change my mind. Nothing will separate me from the love of God. He has not forsaken me. Though he has allowed these things to happen, he still loves me. Nothing will separate that. The enemy has tried really hard. People have tried really hard. This world has tried really hard. Even my own flesh has tried really hard to separate me from God, but no, nah, there's nothing that will separate the love of God from me, which is in Christ Jesus. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or scared of them, for the Lord your God himself is who goes with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. And then two verses later, the Lord himself is who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Because that's what happens, right? We become afraid or discouraged. And the Lord says, hey, take courage. I am with you. I will be with you, and I will deliver you from everything. I will not forsake you, and I will not fail you, for I'm going to be with you. And then he says it in the New Testament. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. When you look at the Old Testament and you made that promise to Israel, the problem with Israel is they walked away from the Lord. That, that's the story with Israel. They walked away from the Lord. Oftentimes the reason why Christians are like, yeah, you know what, or more like ex-Christians, yeah, God wasn't there for me, man. You left them. You left them. You didn't like the present situation. You didn't believe what God had promised. You didn't trust. You weren't willing to wait it out. You forgot that it was about heaven anyways. And so you left them. But God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So if you're going through stuff right now, you're going through stuff right now, we are invited, in fact, commanded to cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. So this word anxiety is the Greek word merimna, meaning solicitude. What does that mean? Agitation. You agitated? Been agitated lately? Cast all your agitation to him. Fear? Nervousness, worries, cast all of that to him. Uneasiness, tension, you've been tense lately. Stress, desperateness, cast those things onto the Lord. Discomfort, discomposure, edginess, torment, vexation, cast those things to the Lord. Doubt, dread, that's a gnarly word right there, dread. Uncertainty, panic, Cast all those things to the Lord, for he cares for you. It's a powerful word right there. Cast all your anxieties. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Hardly ever does a mom abandon their children. And one of the most hardcore loves that there is is the love of a mother for their child. And so the Lord says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. So even if that love fails, I will not fail you. I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. I have inscribed you in the palms of my hands inscribed, like a tattoo. 
one of the most painful places that you can get a tattoo is on the palm of your hands. Oh, but Jesus went further than that when he inscribed us in the palm of his hands. I mean, how else can he say it that proves to us that he loves us? If he loves us this much, why would he leave us or forsake us? You see what I mean? I love you so much that even if the most powerful love on earth was to fail, I wouldn't fail. I would still be there for you. I would still love you. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. So even if my parents who are supposed to love me forsake me, the Lord will not forsake me. I will never leave you nor forsake you, Jesus said. And so, verse 16 of Psalm 10, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. What started off as a why, Lord, have you forsaken me, ends with, you know what, Lord? (laughs) You're in control and you're good. You're good. What started off as a complaint, as a gripe, ends in praise, trust, and worship. What started as what could have led to rebellion ends with, and I submit to you no matter what. I'm submitted to you no matter what. I'm going to obey you no matter what. When you feel abandoned by God, yet continue to trust him in spite of your feelings, you worship him in the deepest way. You worship him in the deepest way. Deeper than any worship session you can have at church, any Bible study you may be a part of. The deepest form of worship is when you feel abandoned and yet you continue to trust him in spite of your feelings. That's the deepest form of worship. Your most profound and intimate experiences of worship will likely be in your darkest days. When your heart is broken, when you feel abandoned, when you're out of options, when the pain is great and you turn to God alone. That's powerful worship. That is, Lord, I turn to you, I trust in you, and the enemy's just like, what? I mean, he was, I believe this to be, that he was taken back by the fact that Jesus did not sin even to death. Though all of those things happened to him, being crucified and so forth, He didn't sin even then. He didn't sin outwardly, nor did he sin inwardly. He didn't sin against God. He didn't accuse God. He didn't do anything against God. He just obeyed God, submitted to his Father. So even when the pain is great, you turn to God alone. That's the most profound and intimate experiences of worship. Look in my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Real life, abandoned completely. So he turned to God and he knew he was all right. He knew that he was all right because God was with him. Be honest with the Lord. If you're afraid, say so. If you're feeling abandoned, tell him. He already knows every sin you've committed and he loves you anyway. Confess honestly, beg for help. Converse with the Lord in reverence and respect, but not as if you were approaching a distant, uncaring being. Nothing could be further from the truth. All you have to do is reach out to feel the grasp of Christ's hand. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked is the way Psalm 73 started. Look at the way it finishes but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I, might be, that I may declare all your words. So he starts off by complaining. He ends by praising and worshiping. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right, we saw that. that's the way Psalm 22 starts. Look at the way it finishes. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. 
But when he cried to him, he heard, my praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Wow, that's the way Psalms 22 ends. It starts with, why have you forsaken me? And it ends with praise and worship. How long, Lord, will you hide yourself from me? Same psalm, blessed be the Lord forever, amen and amen. And maybe your prayers, maybe tonight, that's the way it started. Oh, uh, why? I don't even want to be here. Why am I even here? I hope that we learn from them. And they praised the Lord. They started with complaining. They started with griping. They started with questionings. They were frustrated. They were angry. But they end in praise and in worship and in submission. They end with trusting in the Lord. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is how he died, Paul. The same way that said, 40 stripes, minus one, five times. And deaths, hunger, shipwreck, persecution, beatings, you name it. At the end of it all, he wasn't bitter. At the end of it all, he wasn't agnostic. He wasn't atheist. He wasn't resentful. There, there was nothing but praise and worship. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. So if Paul can do it, we can do it. It's the same spirit. Maybe the only difference between us and Paul is that Paul just believed more. He just trusted more. He just lived by faith more and by feelings less. Maybe that's it. The same Holy Spirit. If he could do it, we could do it. Amen?